Greetings, Tobarishi. Been a while, hasn't it? So today, let's do Afghanistan. Yes, there have been automatic comparisons with Vietnam, and the pundits uh, savor Joe Biden's Saigon moment. Yeah, this really has nothing to do with Sleepy Joe himself. All the U.S. presidents since El Shrubbo have had their peckers in this woodpile. What you have in Kabul is, more broadly, the collapse of yet another Western-imposed colonial regime. The implosion of the European colonial project in the 1950s and 1960s has been given a new lease on life by the USA. And despite the American belief in its exceptionalism, the U.S. of A.'s own imperialism follows the same circular trajectory down the toilet bowl. Afghanistan is but another case in point following the U.K. and USSR. If anything, Moscow's retreat was much more dignified than the usual U.S. grandstanding of staying the course and then pell-mell, ass over tit, last right off the sinking ship, running scramble. The ones to really pity here are the white man's natives, the good Afghans who helped us in our colonial mission from the restless and surging bad natives. Unfortunately, such is the fate of all collaborators with foreign occupation armies. Just ask the French resistance fighters of World War II. Another parallel is the 1900 Boxer Rebellion in China. The foreign missions, present only for the good they could do to liberate Chinese women and girls, of course, were butchered by heathen insurgents and their convert mission natives with them. Such is the tragic scenario we'll likely see in the former U.S. colony in Kabul. Some of you may be puzzled as to why any of this should be coming to pass. After all, the U.S. spent trillions of big bucks in national development for the long haul. Reading the lamentations in the U.S. and U.K. media, you never know how so much of this uh, so-called development went not to the real Afghan people, but to the contractors' pockets and creating a bloated and unsustainable infrastructure on totally dependent on foreign aid to survive and on the bribes necessary to get the taking class to do its make-work jobs. But even so, why? Why? Did the Taliban just come back and take it all back? Didn't the foolish, silly Afghans learn the first time around? Well, let's ask this basic, basic question to baristas. What are the Taliban? Besides people, of course. Terrorists? Fundamentalists? Nuts with guns and Asian NRA? Yes, but something much more basic, so obvious it won't occur to most of you right away. Give up? Why, Tupaneros, the Taliban are Afghans, fighting in their own country against a foreign occupying power, growing ever more desperate, ever more lost, ever more brutal. And that is why they have inevitably won. Your army must go home at some point, though for a long time we did not believe so. They are home. The mission Afghans caught in the middle are the ones with the real existential crisis. I'm sure the big ones who fed off the U.S. sugar tit and the heroin trade and built those new huge mansions in Kabul with your money will be airlifted out to forced uh, cheers of the media, and I'm sure the U.S. government will make a way for them, nail salons maybe, which it will never do for normal citizens trying to stay afloat in the COVID pandemic, like you, after all, of which strategic importance are you in the grand plan of the masters of mankind. Some of you older folks may remember 20 years ago when we said this shit show was exactly how it would turn out. Of course, we have the satisfaction now of rubbing it into you rah-rah pundits and will deservedly gloat in our righteousness over your once again chapped asses. But there is a reason you ass clowns never learn. You don't want to. It's not just that empires in your DNA. It's because each generation derives its own profit from its own misadventures. If there are no imperial wars of conquest, there is no need of empire, and the military-industrial tech contractor complex is out of a job. World War II gave Granddad his money, Vietnam gave you Daddy's money, and now you needed your own cash cow to line your pockets, yours being the war on terror. Yet your fool's errand was to be even grander. A Pentagon report of 2004, released by Peter Pace with the Joint Chiefs of Staff, referred to the New World War not as a war on terror, but the Long War. Pace wrote that while the Cold War dominated the world from 1946 to 1991, the Long War could determine the shape of the world for decades to come. An open-ended, unending conflict, unlimited in time and space to keep Daddy's war bucks raining while grinding the planet to dust. Of course, they have an escape plan, space flight. Now you know why the 1% is investing in private space technology. But what are the women and girls left behind, the biggest beneficiaries of the white man's native uplift? Yes, they will be outfitted by Hodges of Kabul for the season's new full-length burqa with matching veil accessories, but let me ask you, were the 20 years of carpet bombings and drone strikes over rural Afghanistan and its families worth all this female liberation to you? Was it a fair trade-off? 
Did the girls empowered by the white upper middle class missionaries justify the so-called collateral massacres at how many village weddings? And the oppression and restrictions on women in Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, India, do you have any extra fingers for hand wringing over them? Sharia law, however much of a downturn it is, is an improvement over Pushtun tribal law, which is merely caveman law. And unlike democratic India, I've never heard of bride burnings in Kabul. But then the bride burners of Hyderabad don't get in the way of Western Empire anymore, so no missionaries are needed to straighten them out. So the bottom line question, as Americans are fond of saying, was the Afghan mission a failure? Absolutely not! Because according to the S&P 500, the top five contractors saw stocks returning a 10 to 1 dividend, collectively for Boeing, Raytheon, Lockheed Martin, General Dynamics, and North of Grumman. If you had invested $10,000 in their stocks in September 2001, you'd be sitting on nearly 100000 now. So, no, as far as Washington and Wall Street are concerned, the blood was worth it, and they got their dollars worth out of the place. I suspect the true reason for this imperialismus interruptus, that is, U.S. pullout, is that it is no longer profitably cost-effective to stay. The more invested there, the less available there is for new markets globally. The more drain on resource allocation... Can I knock on the phone? Well, now, who could this be? Hello? Why, it's Rudyard Kipling. Well, pip, pip, and cheerio to you, old toff. What's that? You've got something to say to the Yanks about the white man's burden? Well, the Maristanis do you stiff upper lippers one better. Since 9 they cry for themselves as the victims. They are the raghead's burden. It's all the natives' fault for being natives and needing us in the first place. Just for that alone, they ought to be bombed. 